Hello to you. I'm Joe Ryan of AmericanCivilWar.com. You know, we're, we're getting closer uh, to September 17th, which, as most of you know, is the anniversary of the Battle of Antietam. It'll be the 150th uh, anniversary uh, this year. And it occurred to me, uh, you know, catching up with the uh, recent uh, presentations that some of the Civil War historians have been making, and it would be a good opportunity to present to you uh, as briefly as possible with uh, slides and uh, with video uh, an overview of the situation uh, that uh, is usually uh, abbreviated uh, by the press of time when historians speak. And you know, there are uh, a group of historians that, you know, make a reputation over the years talking about uh, General Lee and McClellan and uh, the Battle of Antietam. Uh, there's a David Bright from Yale who you can see on YouTube who lectures a great deal although his his forte is usually to talk about grand subjects of politics uh, rather than uh, the details of the campaign much less uh, uh, the battle itself. And then you have Gary Gallagher at University of Virginia who who has spent a lot of time going around the United States uh, lecturing, and, and he's got a lot to say about about uh, General Lee's state of mind, about McCullen's state of mind, and about uh, how the Battle of Antietam happened. Uh, a third historian uh, who has obvious credentials, a Pulitzer Prize winner, is James McPherson, uh, professor emeritus of history at Princeton University. Uh, there's a uh, fourth gentleman, uh, James uh, Robinson, who's a professor of history at uh, Virginia Polytechnic College in, uh, in Virginia. And these gentlemen, uh, they're very fine fellows. I, I don't mean <laughs> any, any sense to, uh, to uh, you know, be overbearing with their with their, uh, uh, their storylines, but they are storylines and it's only fair that uh, that uh, you get an appreciation for the difference, the significant difference between the discipline of historians in preparing their work for publication and the discipline of trial lawyers in preparing their case for presentation to a jury in court. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I got to tell you, there's a there's a big difference between the truth of history as uh, presented by these uh, gentlemen that I've described and truth in court. And I suppose the reason is that trial lawyers actually have to prove their case in court and this room itself, while it's a library, could be a courtroom. And a courtroom, ladies and gentlemen, has a distinct atmosphere all its own. And when trial lawyers who are prepared and who are reasonably articulate in their uh, verbal skills come into a trial court and face a jury, uh, the system, the process, is being controlled by the rules of evidence, which are, which are monitored by the trial judge. And uh, the competition between the lawyers in presenting respective sides of the case uh, and the, um, uh, the, the details that are presented in, in the course of many weeks of trial is obviously a, a significantly different experience for the viewer, who in this case would be the juror, and, and the audience that attends these rather uh, abrupt, uh, capsulated uh, uh, presentations that are made in lecture form by these various historians that I've described. So I'm, I'm just going to take a short period of time to present to you uh, the evidence as it exists uh, that explains General Lee's intent in invading Maryland. Now you'll find as we go through this that the historians have got a lot of reasons why General Lee entered Maryland on September the 6th, 1862, and none of those reasons are, are the, is the intent 
that uh, he intended to fight a battle. That he walked into the into the state with the intent to fight a general battle with McClellan's vast horde of soldiers. Uh, another point that the historians uh, I think are pretty cavalier about when you speak about the discipline between the two professions, the story and the trial lawyer, is, is, the, is the proof of the fact that General Lee's intent in entering Maryland was to bring on what we know today as the Battle of Antium. And the proof of that fact is found in proving that the lost order that they chuckle about is in fact uh, an order that General Lee caused to be lost in a specific fashion in order to bring to McCullen's mind uh, the fear that as he proceeded westward toward the South Mountain and attempted to enter the various passes and get out into the Cumberland Valley that he was going to be attacked probably from two directions on his right by General Lee's force behind Turner's Gap and on his left by General Jackson's force behind Crampton's Gap. Now, let me show you uh, in, a, in a nutshell how the battle itself, the Battle of Antium, unfolded and uh, talk about the, the politics of the battle between the general officers and then go on to this issue of why it is the historians uh, don't want to face the reality of General Lee's true intent. And then the ancillary question that, that hangs on that issue, uh, the proof of General Lee's intentional loss of the order. The Battle of Antium was fought at Sharpsburg, Maryland on Constitution Day, September 17, 1862. At dawn on that day, Joe Hooker's corps came against the left flank of General Lee's line, attacking Jackson's command that held the ground from about the Nicodemus Farm at the north end of the battle zone down to the T-intersection in front of the Dunkard Church where the Smoketown Road and the Hagerstown Pike come together. Jackson's men advanced, and the front of the two forces collided in Mr. Miller's 40-acre cornfield, where they ravaged each other with repeated attacks and counterattacks for almost three hours. As the two sides became exhausted, Joseph Mansfield appeared with his corps, coming into the battle from the northeast, and with Mansfield killed almost immediately, the corps elements, under the command of other officers, drove Jackson's right back as far as the Dunkard Church. But then, Lee pulled some of Longstreet's and D.H. Hill's troops from the center and threw them against the left flank of Mansfield's corps, forcing it back into the east woods. About this time, Bull Sumner, with his lead division, Sedwick's, appeared at the top of the Smoketown Road. In front of him, through the smoke of the battle, Sumner saw disorganized masses of rebel soldiers leaving the field and disappearing into the west woods. Sumner had been nicknamed Bull in his old army days after having charged a squadron of troopers into a Comanche camp on the plains, killing in the process mostly women and children. Now, perhaps remembering the thrill of the bugles that day and the charge into the Comanche village, Sumner's mind apparently filled with the thought that the rebels were abandoning the field and beginning to retreat, and he ordered Sedwick to move immediately to the pursuit. Forming in three lines, the division of 10,000 men marched across the cornfield and into the west woods. Coming out the opposite side, into a field, the front ranks were immediately cut down by blasts from a rebel line of cannon. Thrown back into the wood in confusion, all three lines of Union infantry crowded together in the woods. As this was happening, elements of two rebel divisions just arrived from Harper's Ferry, McLaws and Walker, rushed across the knoll where the Dunker Church sits and slammed into the left and rear of Sedwick's division. Within 20 minutes, Sedwick 
and most of his brigade officers and half his division were either dead or wounded. The survivors, now making a mad dash to get out of the west woods, recross the cornfield and take cover in the east woods. General McCullen, in his plan of battle, had envisioned his corps like waves, one after the other, crashing into and finally through the defenses of Lee's left wing. In the plan's execution, he expected Franklin's corps to support Sumner's in continuing the pressure that Hooker's and then Mansfield's corps had applied against Jackson's front. McClellan expected that the pressure of these four corps would cause a breakthrough that would result in the Union gaining possession of the road that leads from Sharpsburg to the Potomac River crossing at Shepherdstown. But with Hooker wounded and Mansfield killed, command of McClellan's right wing fell to Sumner, and Sumner lost his poise when Sedwick's division was crushed. And now, with French's and Richardson's divisions engaging rebel forces in the sunken road, he had ordered Franklin to stand on the defensive. Receiving by semaphore signal a message from Franklin informing him of Sumner's order, McCullen rode to the scene and found Sumner adamant that fresh masses of rebel forces were going to counterattack against his front at any moment, and Franklin's corps was needed to repel the impending attack. McClellan considered relieving Sumner, but who was there to take his place? Sedwick, the first choice, had been wounded in the fight in the West Woods. If Howard, who had taken Sedwick's place, was moved up, who would take his place? And how well, if such a change was made in the middle of the battle, would the staff work in reorganizing the troops for another push across the field? As Franklin tells the story in his report, On arriving, I formed my divisions for the attack. But General Sumner arrived on the spot and directed that the attack be postponed. Shortly after, the commanding general came to the position and decided that it would not be prudent to make the attack. By this time, Sumner's 2nd Division, French's, had by Sumner's orders drifted into battle with D.H. Hill's division, holding the sunken road, and the battle continued there as McCullen's right wing went over to the defensive. D.H. Hill battled French to a standstill until Sumner's 3rd Division, Richardson's, came up on Hill's right and overlapped it. The firing into the ranks caused the rebels to give way in panic, and the whole pressure of the fighting slipped backward into the area of the paper form with Brooks's Union Brigade almost gaining the Hagerstown Road until driven back by the appearance of a line of cannon and elements of Lee's last reserve, R.H. Anderson's division. But Anderson was wounded, and the politician, Roger Pryor, taking Anderson's place, bungled things, putting Lee's center almost an empty hole. This, along with Sumner's blunder, became the crisis of the battlefield now. McCullen had ridden from his headquarters at the Pry House to confer with Sumner and Franklin. He had urged Sumner to get Franklin in action, and when Sumner refused, claiming there were rebel masses concentrating in the West Woods to counterattack, McCullen had returned to the Pry House and conferred with Fitz John Porter, commanding his last reserve, the Fifth Corps. McCullen wanted Porter to advance across the Antium by the middle bridge and climb the hill in front of Sharpsburg and push the enemy in the center. But then, worried about Lee actually having fresh troops massing behind the hill, McCullen countermanded the order and the battle petered out in the center as it had on the left. By this time, the Ninth Corps, commanded technically by Cox, 
As far as Burnside was concerned at this time, he commanded the left wing, and therefore it was not his responsibility to control the tactical movements of the Ninth Corps. Rodman's division had gotten across the stream by Snavely's Ford, while Cox and Sturgis got their men across by the lower bridge. And all these forces, about 10,000 men, over about two hours of fighting, had managed to almost gain the crest of the hill and get into the streets of Sharpsburg. But then, suddenly, at this crucial moment, A.P. Hill's division, perhaps 6,000 men, appeared on the Union flank from the direction of the Potomac, and as these men slammed into the Union forces, Hill's artillery batteries unlimbered and were in action, pounding the Union men with round after round of canister fire, the fire killing Rodman and causing the Union attack to collapse, and the men fall back down the hill to the stream bank. This brought the fighting on the 17th to an end. On the 18th, the two armies faced each other, but McCullen decided to wait for two fresh divisions to arrive from Frederick, and the day passed without a second battle. When dawn came on the 19th, Lee's army was gone. Now, of course, that was a uh, uh, that was an explanation of the the Battle of Antietam in, in a nutshell in 15 minutes, and that was just to you know set the stage for us to take a look at what uh, the historians and the Civil War writers have to say about General Lee's intent in bringing the battle on. So when was that intent formed, and uh, how? Uh, indeed was General Lee able to uh, uh, manufacture a situation where his intent uh, could be achieved. Uh, and to do that we're going to take a look at, at what uh, some of these gentlemen that I've described to you uh, have said. Now I'm going to be talking about uh, a gentleman named Stephen Sears who uh, doesn't have quite the academic credentials that uh, Professor Gallagher and Professor McPherson uh, and Professor Blight have, uh, but he is certainly the most prolific. Uh, and I don't want to appear like I'm picking on the, the fella, but uh, you know, I mean, he's a professional writer and he makes his living. Uh, repeating uh, almost endlessly the story of the Battle of Antietam, and, and uh, you know his writings go back 20 years. Uh, in addition to other books, he's written uh, Jars McCullen, The Young Napoleon. Uh, he's uh, he's published. Uh, he's edited the papers of uh, George. McClellan, and I have to tell you that you know one reason that uh, McClellan takes such a a hit uh, from uh, in his reputation is because uh, his wife Mary Ellen allowed his private letters that he had written to her uh, from the field as these events were occurring to be published after his death in a book. Uh, that's entitled McCullen's Own Story. Mary Ellen was a very bitter woman. Uh, she didn't uh, appreciate the way her husband had been treated and upon his death she left the United States and she went to Europe where she remained until she died. So these letters should not have been published. Uh, if you look at the papers of uh, Ulysses S. Grant which are, I don't know, ten volumes worth there are letters that are published that were written privately by him to his wife, but when you read them, uh, there's nothing in there that that in any substantial way gives you uh, uh, the kind of embarrassment that, that these letters that George wrote to his wife give. Now, does, does that mean that Grant didn't write letters to his wife that uh, exposed his character and personality? his private thoughts in a way that 
George's letters to his wife did, those letters were probably not made available for publication. Uh, in addition to uh, the letters of George McClellan, uh, Mr. Sears has, has written a fine book, Landscape Turned Red, which is uh, uh, about uh, 350 pages of description of the Battle of Antium, something that I've condensed in 15 minutes. And uh, in this book he talks about the Lost Order at some length. He also wrote recently another book called Controversies and Commanders, in which again he, he devotes a, a chapter to his analysis of the situation involving the Lost Order. He's written uh, articles about the Lost Order in magazines such as North and South Magazine. So, you know, he, unfortunately he's going to be a witness in our trial, ladies and gentlemen, that we're going to have to take a very, a very careful look at. And to do that, I, I, I've got my old jury instruction book, California Approved Jury Instructions, and there's just a couple of them I want to read to you to, to, to give you some guidance. This is the kind of guidance you get in court. Credibility of witnesses. The instruction reads this way. You are the sole and exclusive judges of the credibility of the witnesses who testify. In determining the credibility of a witness, you may consider any matter that has a tendency in reason to prove or disprove the truthfulness of the testimony, including but not limited to the following, his demeanor while testifying, the manner in which he testifies, the character of his testimony, the extent of his capacity to perceive, to recollect, and to communicate. The extent of the opportunity to perceive any matter about which he testifies. His character for honesty and veracity. The existence or non-existence of a bias, interest, or other motive. A statement previously made by him that is inconsistent with his testimony. A statement made by him that is consistent with his testimony. The existence or non-existence of any fact testified to by him. His attitude, attitude toward the action and toward the giving of testimony. His omission of untruthfulness. Now, let's, uh, Professor McPherson also has something to say about this issue, so necessarily he's he's going to be presented to you in terms of his prior statements. Uh, let's, let's get into uh, the first question, which is, uh, why do these historians have a difficulty in recognizing that General Lee intended, when he first entered Maryland, to bring McClellan to battle at Sharpsburg? And then secondly, we'll prove, we'll prove that intent by demonstrating that Special Order 191 was not lost by accident. That, it's, that General Lee intended McClellan to be given this order in order to uh, put fear into McClellan's mind that if when he advanced toward the South Mountain he was going to get into serious trouble. And it's, and it's a very substantial point to make here because from McClellan's point of view, his sole experience with General Lee was during the seven days. And General Lee, from the first moment he took command of the Army of Northern Virginia on June 25, 1862, immediately put his forces on the offensive. He seized the initiative and he began attacking McClellan's position uh, on the left bank of the Chickahominy. Relentless, constant pressure against McClellan's front. Regardless of the casualties that were being suffered in the process, forcing McClellan to retreat away from Richmond and down to Harrison's Landing. Uh, 
you know, was was so violent in the process that even though he suffered horrendous casualties at Malvern Hill, uh, General Lee continued the concept. Now, as soon as he recognized that McClellan no longer was interested himself in going over onto the offensive and beginning another effort to get closer to Richmond, General Lee tor turned his attention to John Pope and the Army of Virginia that was concentrating on the Rappahannock River in Culpeper County to the north of Richmond. And the first thing that General Lee did was send Stonewall Jackson through Gordonsville to the Rapidan to confront Pope. And General Lee followed with the rest of his army and through a period of maneuvering over several weeks the situation ended up with the Battle of Second Manassas. And from Second Manassas, General Lee doesn't really hesitate too long in moving into Maryland. Now we'll also take a, le a look to try to understand General Lee's intent. We'll take a look at the correspondence that we have available to us that passed between General Lee and Jefferson Davis between the time General Lee entered Maryland and the time the Battle of Antietam occurred to try to see if we can discern in the language that's recorded in these documents what's going on in General Lee's mind. As the evidence will show you ladies and gentlemen the difference between the discipline of historians and the discipline of trial lawyers is profound. Trial lawyers don't have the luxury of pontificating without a solid foundation of fact to support their statements. Trial lawyers investigate the facts endlessly. They organize them and then they attempt to prove those facts by admissible evidence. And it's the requirement of admissible evidence that provides the trial lawyer with the discipline the historians lack. And then, of course, like historians making presentations to the public, trial lawyers argue their case to the jury. Let's find out what Stephen Sears says. Decide to go on the offensive and march into Maryland. Steve, let's start with you. Well, he really didn't have much choice. Uh, after Second Bull Run, he could go four directions, literally the four directions of, of the compass. And if he went toward Washington, he had not the uh, arms or the heavy artillery to besiege Washington. And if he went back south, he was admitting that his uh, plan, his offensive plan, had failed. If he went west into the Shenandoah Valley, he could supply his men. But he couldn't, he would just be marking time, and he would lose the advantage, the initiative. So he ended up going north, uh, where there was a lot of food. And a lot of, uh, they thought they would raise Marylanders to join this Confederate cause, which didn't turn out to be true. But he really didn't, he couldn't stay still. And he had to go, this was his best option. Now, if we were in the trial court, ladies and gentlemen, the trial lawyer would spend six hours cross-examining Mr. Sears on this, on this testimony, going through it, showing the jury where Mr. Sears is supported by the evidence and where Mr. Sears' statement is contradicted grossly by the evidence. For example, the highlighted portion of his testimony, General Lee's defensive plan had failed. Does anyone here in the courtroom have a clue what Mr. Sears is referring to by General Lee's, quote, defensive plan, unquote, much less that it failed? Does that make any sense to you, ladies and gentlemen, based upon all the facts and circumstances you know of? General Lee had no defensive plan. <laughs> General Lee, from the moment he took command of the army to, to the moment the Battle of Antietam ended, was on the offensive, tactically and strategically. So 
let's cut Mr. Sears some slack and just assume that as he made this extemporaneous statement, his mind slipped. Well, what about this next portion that's highlighted? But he would just be marking time and he would lose the advantage of the initiative. Think about that. What is Mr. Sears suggesting? He tells us that of the four directions of the compass, in his opinion, General Lee's best option was to enter Maryland. Now, why was it his best option? Does Mr. Sears give us a reasonable explanation for that in his testimony? Well, there's a lot of food uh, that was inducing General Lee to go forward. And his entry into Maryland would attract the people of Maryland to the Confederate cause. These two predicates are the basis for Mr. Sears' opinion that General Lee's invasion into Maryland was the best option. Well, that's silliness. And for a gentleman that's been writing about this for 20 years, frankly, it's pretty pathetic. Yes, it was General Lee's best option to enter Maryland, but why? Let's give Mr. Sears the benefit of the doubt and assume that what he really meant to say here was that if General Lee went back south, he would be admitting not that his defensive plan had failed, but that he was now too weak to maintain the offensive. And if McClellan smelled that, we all know what would have happened next. McClellan would have come charging out of the forts of Washington to do battle with General Lee. And, of course, if General Lee moved directly west into the Shenandoah Valley by going through Loudoun County and crossing the Blue Ridge, McClellan would understand that General Lee did not have the strength to fight a battle out in the open. And McClellan would pursue him. And a battle would result somewhere in the Shenandoah Valley under circumstances in which General Lee had available to, him, to, his, to his army now only about 40,000 men with very little food and with very little supplies and with no place in the Shenandoah Valley where he could anchor his flanks to present as tight a front as possible. His front has to be very, very tight because to man it, he only has these 40,000 men. Whereas McClellan has 100,000 men and can easily outflank him in the valley and turn his rear. So General Lee has no choice but to go into Maryland fight a battle with the idea of bringing McClellan to a stop so that Lee will not be pursued when he goes into the Shenandoah Valley. That's the key. How are we going to prevent, how are we going to induce McClellan not to pursue us when we go into the Shenandoah Valley? Let's take a look at Professor McPherson's answer to uh, the question of General Lee's intent. Now, Professor McPherson doesn't spend any time really talking about military tactics and strategy. He spends his time talking about these more abstract ideas relative to uh, politics. And he, he basically strings together... Uh, like uh, boxcars on a train going down the track, uh, several different concepts uh, to come to his conclusion that uh, General Lee entered Maryland, quote, hoping to conquer a peace, unquote. Oh, I see, Professor. 
In September of 1862, the war situation was such that the Lincoln government was just going to cave in uh, when uh, another uh, uh, victory like Second Manassas occurred inside uh, the boundaries of Maryland. Uh, or uh, by some miracle, uh, this uh, victory in Maryland that you envision uh, happening with uh, General Lee's 40,000 men challenging 100,000 Union soldiers is that the Democrats are somehow going to just sweep into power uh, like the Republicans did uh, in 2010 and take over the House of Representatives with a majority of 50 or 60 members. How silly is this? How can we call this serious historical uh, work? Um, yeah, we, we don't want to we don't want to uh, uh, denigrate the fine credentials and reputations of this Princeton professor emeritus, but uh, please, it seems to me he's talking down to the audience that he was facing in the New York Historical Society in May of 2011 when this uh, statement was made. Well, I think uh, Lee was always an avid reader of northern newspapers and a follower of northern politics. And he was well aware that congressional elections were scheduled for October and November of 1862. Uh, and he even wrote to Jefferson Davis saying that by invading Maryland uh, and, as he hoped, inflicting another defeat on the Army of the Potomac, maybe on the scale of uh, Second Manassas, uh, that he could actually influence that election uh, and maybe the Democrats would gain control of the House and force the Lincoln administration to, uh, to uh, negotiate for, for peace. Um, also at the same time we need to remember that the war is taking place not only in Virginia uh, but across a front of a thousand miles and the Confederates were on the offensive in the Western Theater too where General Braxton Bragg and General Edmund Kirby Smith were invading Kentucky. Uh, also with the idea of winning that border state for the Confederacy. So when Lee went across the Potomac River into Maryland in the first week of September 1862, Confederate uh, soldiers were on the march elsewhere uh, with the hope of, uh, in effect, I think, uh, conquering a peace by forcing the Lincoln administration to, uh, to negotiate with them. Also, Lee's uh, personality, his character, uh, was never... Uh, satisfied with remaining static, remaining on the defensive. Uh, he always wanted to seize and hold the initiative. Uh, and that meant uh, always uh, going on the offensive. And we'll see that happening over and over again uh, in, in, in Lee's career, as long as, he, as long as his armies are physically capable of doing that. Of course, uh, Professor McPherson his statement contains some strains of objective truth. Uh, the challenge for you, the judges of the facts, ladies and gentlemen, is always to be able to sift from the chaff the wheat. And in all these statements witnesses make, there's going to be uh, some facts that are accurately stated and some facts that are not. And it's difficult to pull out the ones that are true from the ones that are false. So when Professor McPherson shifts to the issue of Kentucky and the fact that uh, Bragg's army of about uh, 35,000 men have uh, reached the vicinity of uh, Mumfordsville, some few miles north of Bowling Green in the central area of Kentucky. Uh, you know, he's, he's raised an important point. These two offensives... Lee's into Maryland and Bragg's into Kentucky are, are two offensives that are coordinated. Uh, this is an effort by uh, the Confederacy to uh, relieve 
the pressure that's been brought to bear against the heartland of the Confederacy and its capital in Virginia. And neither one of these armies is in any sense physically capable of engaging in the kinds of battles that General Lee uh, created during the Seven Days. They just don't have the numbers for it. And in terms of logistics, they're operating on the razor's edge of starvation. So at the time that we're speaking of, uh, Bragg is on the south side of the Green River, and he's spending about two and a half to three days standing there on the defensive waiting for Buell to come up and attack him. And only when Buell does not do this does Bragg finally begin moving away from the Green River up to Bardstown to join Kirby Smith, who's come from the Cumberland Gap in Lexington, because Bragg cannot remain where he is. He's run out of supplies. Now, it's also important to keep in mind that during this same period of time that I'm speaking of, two and a half days, from about uh, September uh, 20th to September 23rd, President Lincoln publishes the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, of course, all the historians want to tell you that this particular moment was chosen by President Lincoln because he had, quote, sort of a victory at Antium. And uh, on that basis, he, he wanted to get this thing out. The reality is considerably different than that. During that two-day to two-and-a-half-day period, President Lincoln was necessarily concerned that there was going to be a duplicate battle in front of the Green River, as there had been with General Lee and McClellan on the Potomac, and that the outcome of that battle was certainly, in his mind, in doubt. And if that battle had occurred and had gone in favor of Bragg, as far as Lincoln was concerned, there was a very serious high probability that the young people of Kentucky would indeed flock to the Confederate banner and that suddenly Kentucky would again be uh, in such a condition that the Union armies would have to return to that state to suppress an act of rebellion. It's that fact, that reality, that induced President Lincoln to publish the proclamation when he did. Remember the jury instruction on credibility of witnesses? In determining the credibility of a witness, you may consider his demeanor, his character, the extent of his capacity to perceive, the extent of his opportunity to perceive any matter, his character. Credibility is the test. And Charles Marshall, aide de camp to General Lee, was as close a witness to the event as it occurred than anyone. And as you can see, his testimony in the form of a letter he wrote in 1878 to a individual in France who had written a tome called The American Civil War, sets forth in a nutshell the objective truth of history. The theory of the indirect approach is, is not something new, but dates back uh, thousands of years. 
The proof of Lee's intent in entering Maryland was to fight a battle at Sharpsburg is proved by the fact that Special Order 191 was not lost by accident. Now, let's present the testimony of two expert witnesses and then consider their testimony in relation to the proven facts. And in that regard, I'll give you a jury instruction that will be helpful in your analysis. In resolving any conflict that may exist in the testimony of expert witnesses, you should weigh the opinion of one expert against that of another. In doing this, you should consider the relative qualifications and credibility of the expert witnesses, as well as the reasons for each opinion and the facts upon which the opinion is based. Talk for a minute about the background of the famous lost orders and how decisive a role they played in, in the run-up to the battle. Stephen, why don't you start? Well, the lost order was General Lee's uh, plan to capture Harper's Ferry, the garrison at Harper's Ferry, which was 12,000 men and a good deal of uh, armament. And so he, this was in, in Frederick, and on se September 9th, he writes out orders to divide up his army into four segments. Stonewall Jackson was going to go out to the west, and other was going to completely surround Harper's Ferry. And he sent these out by courier to all the generals involved. And uh, the copy that went to Stonewall Jackson, uh, Jackson read it and then copied it again for D.H. Hill, who had been under his orders. Uh, one of the couriers was also taking the same message to D.H. Hill, and of course it never arrived. And it was dropped in a clover field south of Frederick. And uh, when we don't know why this happened or how it, how it could have been prevented, or at least discovered, because the uh, courier was supposed to deliver the envelope in which the, th the message came with the signature and went back to the, uh, to the, the headquarters. But it did not go. I, my own theory is that it was a careless courier, and then he discovered he'd lost it went to DHL's headquarters and asked around and said, oh yes, we have the orders. So he felt much relieved, presumably, and uh, went back to headquarters and nobody seems to have pursued the, the case of getting the uh, proof of delivery. So in any case, uh, on the 13th of September, uh, a Corporal Barton Mitchell of an Indiana regiment, they were bivouacked in this particular clover field and he found this envelope picked it up, uh, read the message. It also had three cigars in the envelope along with it. And he was smart enough to realize, since he recognized all these names and places, that this was pretty important. So he kicked it upstairs, went to his uh, regimental, and went up to, uh, I think it went to brigade. And then they skipped a few levels because each person that saw it realized how important it was. Sears says this was General Lee's, quote, plan to capture Harper's Ferry, unquote. Special Order 191 was General Lee's plan to induce McCullen into battle at Sharpsburg. Now, Sears gives us both an opinion uh, and he sets forth facts. So we'll assume that the facts that he sets forth are the basis of his opinion. Now, the primary fact he refers to is the idea that a courier carrying Special Order 191 from Lee's headquarters dropped it in a field for some inexplicable reason. And that when he dropped it, it was inside an envelope. And in the envelope with the paper that represented the order, Sears tells us, was three cigars. Now, he's manufactured this concept from nothing that exists in the objective record other than a statement made by a gentleman named John Boss who in 1896 published an article 
in which he made that statement, claiming that he was present when the order was discovered in the field. There is nothing in the record in terms of objective evidence, whether the testimony of a precipient witness or other facts that give any credibility to Mr. Boss's statement. Now let's hear what Professor McPherson has to say. The great debate that continues is whether this was a, as you put it, and I think you're pretty decisive on this subject, whether it was in fact a uh, uh, a sloppy courier mistake, or whether it was the most brilliant counter espionage uh, uh, action of the war, which was supposed to throw off McClellan into uh, f falsely comprehending Lee's intentions. Of course, with all of that information, you'd think that McClellan would have been more aggressive and successful. But, um, right. Jim, what do you think? Uh, uh, counter espionage or mistake that wasn't uh, taken advantage of? No, I'm convinced it was a sloppy courier and that the orders were. Um, genuinely orders uh, that uh, they had been lost by the courier. Um, there, there are two other dimensions of it, one of them serious and one not so serious, and the serious one is why did McClellan delay so long uh, before giving orders to uh, different generals, especially to General William F. Franklin to force Crampton's Gap. Uh, those orders went out to uh, um, Franklin at six o'clock that evening uh, and McClellan did actually express a certain amount of urgency uh, in his orders to Franklin uh, because it was Franklin's task to rescue the garrison at Harper's Ferry, which was under siege by uh, 25,000 Confederates uh, under the overall, overall command of Jackson. Uh, Franklin was to force his way through Crampton's Gap and come to the, uh, to the uh, aid of, uh, of the garrison Harper's Ferry by driving away at least some of the Confederate besiegers. Uh, but he didn't actually get started until 6 o'clock the next morning, which was actually 18 hours after McClellan had this information in hand. So McClellan right away, or maybe it was Franklin, uh, who was one of McClellan's closest uh, confidants and, and supporters, uh, did not really take advantage as they could have uh, of, of this lost order of this intelligence uh, windfall that they had. Uh, the other question I have is why was the, were these orders wrapped around three cigars and who got the cigars? <laughs> Nobody knows. Well, of course, ladies and gentlemen, uh, after Professor McPherson uh, tells us that he's uh, convinced that uh, it was the order was lost by a sloppy courier. As soon as he wanders off on this tangent about an entirely different subject that wasn't embraced in the form of the question the moderator asked him, telling us about McCullen's response to the finding of the order, we would have objected, and the court would have stricken from the record the testimony that uh, takes up probably. 80% of his entire answer. So essentially Professor McPherson with his uh, smoothness is deflecting the attention of the audience away from the, the question. At the end of his uh, speech about Mac's failure to uh, take advantage of the order, he uh, chuckles and asks us a rhetorical question, why was the order wrapped around three cigars. Now, that statement contradicts Mr. Sears, doesn't it? Unless, to reconcile the two statements, we assume that the piece of paper is wrapped around the cigars and the paper and cigars are inserted in an envelope large enough to hold these, these things. But he doesn't tell us, does he? Why? the order was wrapped around cigars. So, this envelope, if we were in trial court and uh, a parade of witnesses was coming to the, to the stand to testify about this issue of the lost order, the envelope now would loom as a huge fact in the case. Did the envelope exist? 
Uh, was it large enough to hold uh, the cigars and the paper? Uh, and, and why do we need the envelope? Uh, the excuse is that, well, we're, gonna, we're going to, uh, if we're the courier, we're going to write on the envelope. Uh, we're going to have the person that, that we hand the order to write on the envelope as a receipt. And we're going to return the envelope to headquarters. Now, can someone explain to us why the headquarters staff would give a courier the order in an envelope large enough to hold three cigars? It hardly makes any sense. We can speculate and say, oh, well, there must have been a pal of the recipient of the order on General Lee's staff. And the pal wanted to send D.H. Hill, the recipient, three cigars. And so... To make sure that Hill got them, he wrapped them around the order, put the order in a large envelope, large enough to hold the cigars, and sent the courier on his way. Now, assuming in this speculative statement there's any truth to it, here's a courier now carrying a large envelope, not a simple little piece of paper with three cigars, and somehow, by sloppiness, he drops it in a field and uh, loses it. Now, does that make any sense to you, ladies and gentlemen? And do you think we're actually going to find any legitimate evidence that's going to be introduced into court that would support such an outlandish belief? Here comes Private Barton Mitchell coming up the road from Georgetown. He's been on the march from uh, some distance beyond Urbana all day as a member of the 27th Indiana Regiment. He crosses the Monocacy River and he comes into uh, some farm fields and he's told that he can fall out of ranks with his comrades and he stacks arms. Now these fields had been camped in by thousands and thousands of troops over the last several days, Confederate as well as Union. And these fields would have been littered with the debris that you can expect to find in an abandoned campground. And what Mr. Sears and Professor McPherson want you to believe is that there was an envelope laying on the ground among all this debris that was so attractive to Private Mitchell, despite the heat and his thirst and his tiredness, uh, that he was going to stoop over and bend down and pick up this envelope because he was just so curious to see what was inside. Now, does that strike you, ladies and gentlemen, as something that a reasonable person would do under the circumstances shown by that evidence? Think of yourselves in the jury room as 12 jurors, and the verdict that you're asked to come to depends upon your resolving that specific factual question. The only thing you can do, really, ladies and gentlemen, is put yourself in the shoes of Private Mitchell and ask yourselves, what would a reasonable person do under these circumstances? Now, compare that scenario with the fact that what Private Mitchell saw among all the debris the thing that stood out in his eyes was cigars. And let's assume they're fresh cigars, that he can see they're fresh cigars. Now, would any of us not expect a reasonable person in such circumstances to reach down and pick up that object? Of course, he would. And it's that finding, ladies and gentlemen, that belies the statements that these historians still make. The historians all agree that Private Mitchell discovered a piece of paper and he recognized it as a Confederate movement order and he brought it to the attention of his sergeant, John Bloss, B-L-O-S-S, -S, and the two of them took it 
to the regimental colonel, Mr. Colgrove, and from there it worked its way up to McCullen. Now, the document that you're looking at exists as part of the records maintained by the Library of Congress. And it shows evidence of being folded for a long period of time. Much, much as you'd fold a letter, but in those days they, they folded the, the piece of paper in half and then they folded it in uh, thirds to form what looks like itself an envelope. And it just so happens that when you take this piece of paper and you fold it in that fashion, that you can lay side by side across the face of the folded document, guess what? Three cigars. Now to contradict the experts, or the expert historians, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you the, the statement of Private Mitchell's, car, Private Mitchell's colonel. Silas Colgrove. Colonel Colgrove in 1886, in response to an inquiry made to him by the editors of the Century Magazine, responded with the statement that you see in front of you. Now, in terms of credibility, remember those factors that we take into consideration when we try to assess a witness's credibility. Colonel Colgrove had no axe to grind in 1886. He did not seek out notoriety, publicity. He did not attempt to thrust himself into the center uh, to become a hero, to be the center of attention. The editors had to search him out because they were publishing articles about the NTM campaign and this issue of the Lost Order came up and they were looking for uh, uh, his best recollection of his involvement in this matter and he gave it to them in a, in a writing, in a letter. He told us in 1886 that the 12th Corps arrived at Frederick about noon on September 13th and that uh, his regiment stacked arms. He says, quote, on the same ground that had been occupied by D.H. Hill's division the evening before, unquote. Now, Colonel Colgrove is probably mistaken in his recollection uh, as to who it was, what, what group of soldiers it was that had preceded uh, his regiment in camping in the area in which this order was found. The fact of the matter is that Sumner's Corps came up to Frederick the evening of September the 12th on the, Nash, on the uh, road from Georgetown, crossed the Monocacy, and went into camp in the very fields that the 27th Indiana Regiment occupied the following day. Sumner's Corps moving off to the west uh, as the 27th Indiana came through. So we know that Colonel Colgrove is mistaken in his belief. I mean, he doesn't have any personal knowledge of who was in camp the night before because he wasn't there. Uh, so that is a, a statement of belief, not a statement of a precipient witness's personal knowledge. But the next two paragraphs constitute his personal knowledge, his, his precipient involvement in the event, and therefore the credibility of these statements has substantial probative force. He says, quote, Within a few minutes of stacking arms, the order was brought to me by Sergeant Bolts and Private Barton Mitchell, who stated it was found by Private Mitchell near where they stacked arms. Now notice it's not Sergeant Boss that's finding this order. It's Private Mitchell. And it's obvious that as this matter was related to Colonel Colgrove, Sergeant Boss did not contradict the fact that it was Private 
Mitchell who found the order. The last paragraph, quote, when I received the order, it was wrapped around three cigars. And Private Mitchell stated that it was in that condition when found by him, period, unquote. Now, that's a pretty sharp, declarative statement. Now, the historians ignore it. They, they want to insert into that paragraph the missing envelope. It is possible, of course, that in relating the facts of his finding the order and the cigars, both he and Sergeant Bloss simply left out the envelope. Obviously, they didn't have the envelope with them when they presented themselves to Colonel Colgrove. Isn't that clear to you, ladies and gentlemen? So it must have been left behind in the field. They discarded it, I guess, after they removed the cigars, and they forgot about it when they reported the event to Colonel Colgrove. So again, it comes down to a question of fact that you have to resolve. So, so why the fuss? ladies and gentlemen, about this business of an envelope. Why is it important to you? Why does it have to be in the case? Now, you know, here's a plain piece of paper. Uh, the practice of the staff at the headquarters of uh, General Lee was to take an order written on a piece of paper and fold it so that it forms an envelope like this and then they would write on the outside of the envelope to outside of the piece of paper like this to who it went what it was now <laughs> sergeant boss who's the source who's the predicate let's he's, not, he's the predicate he's the excuse that the historians have for their willingness to perpetuate the myth of the lost order. Uh, ten years after Colonel Colgrove sent his letter to the editors of the Century Magazine, uh, we have a great upswelling in the country among all the old vets that are still alive, forming veterans groups. And, you know, some of these fellows want to be in the limelight. They want to appear at these veterans commissions. Uh, these veteran conventions and they want to, you know, present themselves as having some unique story to tell. And uh, ten years after Colgrove published his letter, in about 1896, Sergeant Bloss was involved in that kind of an organization. And, uh, the members of the organization got involved in a brouhaha over who knew what and who was there and who wasn't. And it was Bloss that came up with the idea that this this lost order was found in an envelope, and in the uh, in the uh, article that he wrote, uh, he calls it a. This is a white. This is a large white envelope, nine by you know, what eleven. He called it a quote large yellow envelope. So uh, sixty. It's almost like forty years after the event that. He's telling us. And what about that business that I gave you about the uh, the the the, pro the improbability of a reasonable person in Private Mitchell's shoes uh, after the hard march that he had conducted to be concerned and, uh, enough to stoop down and, uh, and, and investigate a large envelope found on the laying on the ground of Mitch all of the debris. Think about it. Abandoned clothes, uh, harness, tents, blankets, uh, not even to mention the refuse that you'd expect uh, 10,000 men who've been camping here for a couple of days, Confederate and Union, to have left on the ground that he's going to reach down there. Well, uh, as Boss tells the story in 1896, they're not, it's not just Mr. Mitchell standing up, stacking arms. 
he and Boss and some other members of the uh, of the regiment, the company involved, they're laying on the ground in a clover field. You see, don't you now have an image in your mind of these these gentlemen, you know, laying back and like in a mattress of clover, enjoying themselves and resting and talking and uh, passing water back and forth. And it's in that context, Sergeant Boss tells us uh, in 1896, that he sees laying on the ground uh, within arm's reach of, of Private Mitchell, who's also laying on the ground. No longer are they stacking arms in Sergeant Boss's retelling of the story. They're laying on the ground. And it's Boss that says to Mitchell, hey, let me see what's in that envelope. So, because it was Boss that asked the question, Mitchell rolls over and he takes it and he hands it across his body to Boss, and Boss opens it up. And out spills, Boss tells us, the three cigars and the lost order. And it's from that experience that these two guys go off to Colonel Colgrove. Now, you know, how he, he's not here to be cross-examined under oath, is he, on the witness stand. And the, in, the incongruity of what he's telling us is attested by, by cross-examination, by marshalling of all of the evidence that shows that his story is outlandish. It's not here. But, you know, the evidence remains, the objective evidence of facts remain. And one of those facts is the reality that uh, in 1862 in Maryland, Frederick, Maryland, at the headquarters of General Lee, there weren't any envelopes. Think about it. Think about it. I mean, think of all the orders that are going out on a daily basis. Think of it. Think about, you know, the envelopes that you'd have to have. This is a box that takes 500 envelopes. How many envelopes, how many boxes of envelopes did General Lee's staff have available to them? They were, they didn't even have paper. They were out of paper. They were stealing their paper from the Union Depot at Second Manassas. The ledger book, the letter book that we'll talk about in a minute that the chief of the uh, adjutant general, the assistant adjutant general that was at General Lee's headquarters used to record these kinds of orders was a letter book that was stolen from the Union Depot. Did the Union Depot, did McClellan or John Pope's headquarters staff have boxes of envelopes available that would <laughs> that would fit the size of, of this uh, seven by five piece of paper that we folded here? Is there any evidence in the historical record of envelopes being used? No. What they, what they did as a matter of custom is they had two pieces of paper. They had the paper that was written as an order and then they had a blank piece of paper that was folded with it. And so the outer piece of paper constituted what we would think of as an envelope. And it would be that second piece of paper that the recipient would sign off on if in, if in fact this was done in a routine and consistent customary way and the courier would bring that back. Now that would be in terms of the general practice that would be a done when orders in fact were sent by courier and those are only being sent under certain circumstances. So. We have to ask ourselves, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what's the big deal from the historian's point of view? Why do they need this, this, this rather pathetic piece of evidence from Mr. Boss to maintain their story line? Why do they need it? It's obvious to you. I know most of you have got it figured out. You can't see the cigars. <laughs> and it's the cigars which is the key to the lost order because that's the enticement. That's what a reasonable person would reach down to pick up is three fresh cigars in these circumstances. But if he can't see them because they're hidden in an envelope then there's no good reason why he's going to bend down to pick up anything. And for this order to get to McCullen there has to be a certainty 
for General Lee's uh, mind that the order in fact will reach McCullen, which means it must be picked up by a soldier in the field. And how are you going to orchestrate that when you're already moving well away from Frederick? You're, you're, you're over two days away from Frederick. How are you going to be able to reach back in time and get that order placed in front of Private Mitchell in a situation and in conditions that you're, you're pretty well guarantee he's going to pick it up? Because once he's picked it up, he's looked at it, he'll take it to somebody and it'll end up in McCullen's hands, more likely than not. Well, let's look at the rest of the record and see what we can find. Well, let's take a quick look at the chain of custody that the evidence uh, supports. Uh, Mitchell and Boss uh, brought the document to Colgrove. Colgrove took it to Colonel S.E. Pittman, who was at 12th Corps headquarters. A.S. Williams, who at that time was a temporary 12th Corps commander, sees it. And he writes Mac a note. And he puts the note in an envelope. I mean, that's, that's fairly clear from the evidence. Uh, it, based on his language that he's committed in his note, it's pretty clear that he's probably put it in an envelope. Pittman delivers the order and the note and perhaps an envelope to McCullen's staff who hand the order to McCullen. McCullen causes at least one, if not two copies to be made. One copy goes to his cavalry commander, Kilpatrick, because uh, McCullen wants Kilpatrick to verify that the uh, enemy troops have moved off in various columns and directions that conform to the movement order. McCullen responds to an inquiry made by D.H. Hill in 1868 that he thinks the original order copy is somewhere in his papers and says he will look for it. Sometime after Mac's death in 1885, William Prem, the executor of his estate, writes on an envelope, quote, this is the original order Mac received at Frederick, unquote. And inside this, at the time, McCullen's son, George McCullen Jr., causes his papers to be delivered to the Library of Congress is, in fact, a copy of the Lost Star that we've looked at earlier. Now, what does that evidence of chain of custody do for us? in terms of identifying the actual piece of paper that Barton Mitchell picked up from the field. Is it, in fact, the piece of paper, a copy of which I'm holding in my hand, that is in the archives of the Library of Congress and that was received by the Library of Congress in 1925 from George McCullen's son? It was received in an envelope with Prim's handwriting on it that says this is the original. This is it. This is the one Mac had. But Prim's dead. We don't have any statement from George McCollin about this. So it's a question we can never answer with any degree of absolute certainty. We can, we can as jurors in the jury room, on the basis of evidence, uh, come to some conclusions based upon what the probable truth of the matter is, but we will never know with certainty. And that's the nature of truth in court. What is most probable? Now, this document is in fact folded, but that could have been simply because it was held by McCullen for that many years. This could be a copy that McCullen wrote that had, McCullen had written by someone. So a third person over those many, many years could have come into McCollum's papers and taken the original and sold it on the private market and put it into its place, another copy. Now, there are elements that are intrinsic to the document itself that seem to 
belie that idea. This document looks like a draft. It, it, it has a lot of corrections in it. It's written in pencil. Uh, it just does not have the appearance of being something that was slipped into the record after the fact. But we'll never know. There isn't any physical damage to this document. Uh, there's a little splotch that has penetrated the paper in this location right here that you may or may not be able to see. But other than that splotch, there's nothing on this paper that indicates in any way that it was exposed to the weather. Now, what about the handwriting? One clear way to bridge this, this, this long gap of years between 1925 when George McCullen Jr. gave this to the Library of Congress to September uh, 1862 when it was theoretically lost in the field. What can we use to bridge that massive gap in the evidence? The handwriting. We can't turn to experts to answer, to opine whose handwriting this is because it's not scientific. It's, they're charlatans. It's an illusion. The ordinary individual using ordinary eyesight and intelligence can discern similarities in different handwriting examples any easier than just the next person. So again, it comes down to your responsibility as judges of the facts in the jury room to compare handwriting examples and to come to a judgment, if you can, the what's more likely or not the truth of who wrote this document. Uh, I can tell you, though, ladies and gentlemen, that the, the, in a trial court, through weeks of presentation of evidence, every single individual who would have been a candidate that is to say all the members of General Lee's personal staff as well as the members of the adjutant general staff who were present in his headquarters in Frederick in September have been eliminated. Their handwriting is so distinctly different they could not have written this. And that is a that itself creates inferences, doesn't it? Why that would be? Why why wouldn't this document be in the handwriting of one or the other? Now Stonewall Jackson is a soulmate of General Lee and the two of them certainly were in conference and to the extent that the evidence convinces you that this document was planted, it was planted because the two of them conferred in the idea. It's not Stonewall's handwriting. It's, it's supposed to be signed by the, the Assistant Adjutant General Robert Chilton, but Stephen Sears, who spent 20 years writing about this, never took the time, and it's a lot of time, a lot of effort, to go to the various depositories where the relevant documents are, including this one, and comparing this signature to the, an authentic, proved signature of Robert Chilton. It's not his signature. Robert Chilton didn't write this. There are certain words and phrases in this document that when compared to similar documents, which I'm not going to take the time to get into with you because there's a separate video that you can look at that shows you all of the copies that are relevant to this analysis, uh, tell me that this document is the same text as the document Stonewall Jackson wrote out and delivered to his brother-in-law D.H.L. Uh, D.H.L. was essentially the scapegoat in this situation. The re this thing at the bottom says this is far D.H.L. which is why some historians have been pointing to D.H.L. as the culprit who lost it. D.H.L. denies ever receiving it. And he did receive a copy from his brother-in-law Stonewall Jackson which is convenient because it gives him an excuse when anyone comes and challenges him, hey, D.H., how come you lost this? How come you're so careless? D.H. simply pulls up Stonewall's copy and says, hey, I got, I got a copy from Stonewall. Why would I get a copy from anywhere else? Purely a defensive mechanism for D.H. Hill. His brother-in-law took advantage of him. It's that simple. 
That leaves General Lee. Did General Lee write this? It's a very difficult question. But uh, there are similarities. Now, there's a story of General Lee having injured his hands just before he entered Maryland that might have made it difficult, if not impossible, for him to write. But if it only made it difficult, uh, there are similarities, especially the swish of the D's that suggests that this was written in the hand of General Lee, and he would be the most logical candidate. He would have controlled the entire, the entire conspiracy with the help of Stonewall. He would have written this out. He would have allowed Stonewall to copy it because they recognized they would have to give D.H. Hill some defense to the heavy criticism that might come down against him if things went wrong. And General Lee then had Stonewall deliver this document to the man that actually dropped it in the field in the presence of Barton Mitchell around noon on September the 13th. Now how do I know that? What is it that really nails it down here? Well, for this document to have been lost, as the historians tell us it was, it had to be lost before D.H. Hill left the vicinity of Frederick, right? Before General Lee left the vicinity of Frederick, right? And that was the morning of September the 10th, which meant that this document wrapped around three cigars in or out of the, you know, phantom envelope lay in a farm field exposed to the weather for three days, three nights. And as I'll show you here with a slide, there was a heavy rainstorm that went through this area throughout the entire day of September the 11th, the day after D.H. Hill and General Lee and Stonewall went off on their missions. Rained all day, rained into the night. Then it laid there for another day, the 12th, according to the historian's story, if you're going to believe him, because it had to be lost no later than the morning of the 10th. It laid there waiting for Martin Mitchell to show up on noon, September the 13th. And here it is, 150 years later, having survived those weather conditions. Not rational for any of us to believe that's a reality here. Now let's look at the slide. Right here, here's a string of slides that uh, pretty well wraps up uh, the available evidence. Uh, I talk about these circumstances in other videos, so I'm not going to uh, lengthen this particular one with a repetition of that material. I give you uh, D.H. Hill's communication with uh, McCullen and McCullen's response. I give you Longstreet's uh, statement as a precipient witness as well as his opinion of what happened. I give you Chilton's uh, only uh, known statement about his involvement in this matter which is contained in a letter that he wrote to Jefferson Davis in the 1870s. And uh, last, I'll, I'll show you uh, just a couple of slides that ought to make it uh, clear uh, what the point of all this was uh, as far as this business. Remember that moderator back there? I think his name is Harold Holzer, executive vice president of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. He threw out this uh, remark to uh, Professor McPherson 
suggesting that it was this uh, uh, great uh, feat of counter-espionage, although I don't think that term fits the particular situation. Uh, but he points out that, well, the obvious other side of this case is the idea that this order induced McCullen to do something that otherwise he would not have done. And the last slides that I'll, I'll show you uh, deal with that. Here you see what McCullen would have thought uh, as he came up toward Frederick on the morning of the 13th, 1862. He'd been receiving communications from scouts and cavalry and civilians that had told him that the enemy had left Frederick in several columns on different roads, and Governor Curtin of Pennsylvania, in fact, had sent him a telegram telling them that Stonewall Jackson was reported as being at Williamsport, uh, crossing the Potomac River into the Shenandoah Valley, uh, and that other troops were approaching Hagerstown, and that troops were in the Pleasant Valley area, and that some troops had crossed the Potomac around Point of Rocks and was in Loudoun County. So M McCullen, you know, wired President Lincoln and informed him of all of this, and Lincoln wired back immediately and told him, well, don't let him get away. And McCullen wrote back and said, I, I won't. I'm going uh, gonna to get in there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue him. I'm going I'm to get him. And what he naturally would have been thinking about was intercepting the retreat, as represented by those red arrows and to do that the easiest and quickest way would have been to go directly across the Middleton Valley into that little niche called Pleasant Valley down to the Potomac across the river on the pontoon bridges up through Harper's Ferry and out on the plain of uh, Shenandoah Valley intercepting the retreat of the enemy toward Winchester. It's, it's really very simple. That's what he would have done. Any, any reasonable person in McClellan's Shoes at that time would have done it. But once he got a hold of this order and read it, he, he began to see the second situation represented by the second uh, slide. And that was that according to the order, reading it literally, uh, he would have expected to find General Lee behind Turner's Gap with about 17 rebel uh, brigades. And he would have expected to find Stonewall Jackson uh, returning from the direction of Martinsburg through Shepherdstown, through Sharpsburg, and uh, get in front of uh, Crampton's Gap. So he expected to get attacked. That's what this movement order meant to him. And the, the proof of this is the reality that based on the, the movement order terms, McCullen would have recognized that it was impossible for the enemy to capture Harper's Ferry. Uh, given the scenario of the order. The order called for Lafayette McLaws with two divisions to march into the Pleasant Valley and attempt, in the language of the order, endeavor to capture that place. There's no way in McClellan's mind that McLaws would be able to capture Harper's Ferry from uh, the left bank of the Potomac. And there was certainly no way uh, that he was going to be allowed, McLaws, to cross the Potomac on pontoon boats. Uh, Walker's division had, had left, according to the order, and gone to Point of Rocks, crossed the Potomac into Loudoun County, and marched around to the east face of the Blue Ridge at its tip, called Loudoun Heights. He, too, in that location, couldn't do a thing to capture Harper's Ferry. And as far as the column of Stonewall Jackson was concerned, the Lost Order, contrary to the historians constantly misrepresenting this reality, the Lost Order instructed that Stonewall was going to march to Martinsburg on the Baltimore Ohio Railroad, capture the garrison at that place, destroy the railroad, and then return to the Cumberland Valley. There's nothing in this order about Stonewall Jackson being in command of any expedition going to Harper's Ferry or having any responsibility with regard to Harper's Ferry. And that's the trick of the order. That's another heavy, heavy circumstance that jurors would be thinking about 
when they consider this issue of pro and con of whether the order was lost or planted because General Lee wanted McClellan to believe that Stonewall was lurking behind the South Mountain when in reality the only way Harper's Ferry was going to be captured was if the 25,000 soldiers that Stonewall took with him marched from Martinsburg in front of Harper's Ferry and attacked it from the direction of the south. 